Welcome back to the Director's Garage. I am your host and resident idiot Michael, and today me and Bono here are doing a deep dive into one of the top headphones in the world. Go. <laughs> like, I wonder which ones. <laughs> Certainly a headphone that makes a lot of short lists. We're talking about, yes, the Meze Empyrean. But first, today's video is sponsored by me. <laughs> That's because I bought the Meze with my own hard-earned cash. What do you think, I was gonna pitch something there? No, 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 this show is way, way too uncool for that. So first, let's go to a headliner too. Now, first up, I have a direct message to my two winners of the giveaway, Sammy Anderson and Manuel Arroyo. I need you to email me at directorsgarage at gmail.com. I'm gonna, whoa, <laughs> I'm gonna put it right down here. <laughs> Your email addresses are unavailable unless I'm missing something because I can't find them and you know, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> Just email me, guys, and, and, and send me your addresses, and I'll send those headphones out to you right away. Congratulations again for winning. In case you missed the news, Drop just announced a brand new Sennheiser HD 8XX headphone, which is a retuned HD 800S. I can't wait for these. I generally really like Drop's tunings, and at just $1,100, remember when the HD 700 was the closest thing to that price? It was just a few years ago. These should be special. I was a huge fan of the original HD 800, the Star Wars design, and I mean, what's not to like? It was the second major headphone I ever owned. Owned, and and the reason I bought the Wu Audio WA5LE, I just didn't have anything that would drive those massive 40 millimeter drivers. So it and it shares something in common with the Mezes here that we're going to sound check today. Comfort, comfort, comfort. The only headphone that can come close to the Meze in terms of comfort is the, is that original HD 800. I, I don't know if the subsequent HDs from Sennheiser are as comfortable as the original HD 800, but and, and, you know I've never owned them. But the the HD 800 was my old class leader in terms of comfort. But these just best it. They're, never once have I wanted to take these off. The smallest details are so appreciated. The way the connectors down here, see how they're angled forward? They never touch your collarbone. They never hit your shoulders. Brilliant thinking and a world, world class design. The fit and finish on these things is peerless. They just designed the heck out of them. Now the Meze is a very interesting headphone. I don't think these will be in the lane for everyone, but these have an attitude and an approach that's unique. And if they're in your lane, you're gonna love them. And if they're not in the pocket of your preference, it's gonna be a pass. They're, they're quite expensive at three, thousand dollars so i'd recommend that you audition these before buying them don't do stupid with zeros the way that i did <laughs> now there are open backs and there are open backs this would be one of the latter if you prefer to keep your listening to yourself these headphones are not for you they are almost as loud on the outside as they are on the inside now when testing these i tested both the the leather and these soft alcantara pads and man they just click in with a nice magnetic snap and the Alcantara sounds even darker, in my opinion. They shave off some of the treble. I prefer the leather for Sonics, but man, oh man, when, you, when the Alcantara are so comfy, they're even comfier than the leather. So you're kind of going to win whichever way you go with these things. Now, sound signature is like about midway between reference and fun, I call it. it it's a darker sound signature than I expected. When you think about a planar magnetics, I think about a bright headphone with gobs of clarity. That's kind of the the, the cookie cutter for these planar magnetics. The, the Meze though is darker with less treble emphasis than any other planar I've heard. The benefit is that I couldn't get it to push shouty no matter what I threw at them, but it does seem to lack some of the clarity up top of say the HE1000 V2 or the Susfara, but what you get is a better cohesiveness to the sound, making these headphones quite musical in my experience. There's a slight bass bump, but they're not 
into bass head territory at all, but I appreciate the work that Meze has done to tune these. They have a place for sure. It just comes down to whether their decisions are in your preference or not. Now, I don't find the Meze's to be particularly aggressive. They really sound a little more laid back with a smoother presentation, smoother, smoother. <laughs> Which brings me to detail. I'd expect being a planar magnetic that the detail would be in the upper tier, but it's not. It's more in the middle of the pack and particularly on acoustic guitars. Now this is gonna have a big impact on the mids when we talk about sound structure. I'm not saying they don't have good detail, it's there, but it's not on a par with some of the other top tier headphones at this price point. The imaging is good, but it's not great. Like Bohemian Rhapsody, there are arcing tom rolls I, you can't do tom rolls without doing that, you know, <laughs> so stupid. But some headphones, they kind of come from precise locations across the soundstage. I found the Meze to be a little bit vague. Now, they are good at separation left and right, but it's not the precision of other headphones that I've heard, particularly planar magnetics. But it all comes home when I get to soundstage. We're talking deep. Deep, deep, deep soundstage. Maybe the deepest soundstage I've ever heard in a headphone. The Empyrean presents a wall of sound effect that really fill in the space around your head, at least in my experience. Now, it's a spectacle for sure. The one thing that I'll say though, you know, I've been reviewing a bunch of these headphones for a while now, and I've kind of starting to notice that generally, generally, there seems to be an inverse relationship between imaging and soundstage. The headphones that have a great sound stage usually struggle with the imaging and the headphones that image spot on tend to have a smaller sound stage. This though is a sound stage headphone for sure. Okay, I wanna talk about dynamics for a second because this is a great drum headphone. If you love drums, these headphones will, will not disappoint. This headphone strikes a near perfect balance between body and attack. I think Dynamics might be the Meze Empyrean's greatest asset. The difference between that quietest moment and that loudest moment is huge. Think about like the Dave Matthews Band. You know those, he has those songs that go from quiet to loud very fast. The Meze are perfect for that. And, and they, they so impressed me with those little surprises that I just love to hear. Okay, now it's time to turn our attention to those sound properties. I'm talking about the treble, I'm talking about the mids, and I'm talking about the bass, but you guessed it. They're, it's not gonna be in that order. No, it's not gonna be in that order. It's never in that. I just love doing that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. But let's start off with bass. Now, without overpowering the mix, the bass is well represented. There seems to me to be a little bit of a mid-bass shelf that lends itself to kind of that darker tuning that you experience when you wear these things. But you have more a sense of the body of the instrument, which I love. It gives you kind of a loudspeaker presentation. That said, it's not the last word in slam. It's more like slam light. Slight? Does that work? <laughs> it's there, but it's not as prominent as I prefer. And that kind of keeps this headphone out of the fun category. But the bass does hold detail quite well. Now, if there's a true flaw in the Meze Empyrean, it's going to be the mids. There are, There's like a hollowness to the upper mids that can kind of deliver a mix of a phase effect and sort of create this tubular thing going on. This is in the upper mids only, but it takes the headphone out of the pure reference category, at least to my ears. And there's some congestion too in the mids from time to time. Things can get kind of garbled and bunched up and it, at, at a $3,000 price point, I expect the headphone to avoid that kind of gludgy sound in the mix that comes out of complex passages. And finally, let's talk about treble. There is a nice sheen across the top of the treble that I find quite enjoyable. 
And while the Meze maybe isn't the last name and clarity and detail, the hi-hats hit with a very pleasant crispness. There's, and this is like, despite the fact that it's kind of a darker headphone, it's got this beautiful top layer on the treble and things like snares and, and cymbal crashes. Just think about a song like, like Rush's Tom Sawyer and the, the, the tom rolls and the fills where he crashes cymbals as he's rolling around the kit. Very, very nice effect on the Meze Empyrean. There's a, a terrific glossy sheen on that top layer. I really appreciate. And, and I got to hand it to Meze. I mean, I can see where it would be really tempting for Meze to kind of overcompensate for the, for the darker nature of the headphone by like pumping up a really high, bright, top end on this headphone and they don't they showed terrific restraint there's a lot of really nice work here i'm going to start out the music section with one of my favorite records of all time i'm talking about the clash london calling this was a pivotal record for the clash this was the record that turned the clash from a uk punk band into the mainstream with a rockabilly and scon fused album from 1980 it turned out to be the clash's greatest effort and one of the most important records in rock history it's almost always in the top three when magazines do those like best records of all time lists combat rock may have been their most popular record but if you're looking for an on-ramp into the clash there isn't a more musically interesting album out there and though it's hard to get past that title track because i love it so much london calling the deep tracks on this album are so rewarding. Check out Right Profile, Hateful, Spanish Bombs, Death of Glory. And then there was the song that was completed after the cover was printed and tacked in at the last second, Train in Vain. It's still my favorite Clash song of all time, even though it's like probably their, one of their more commercial efforts. But one of the very best plays of Train in Vain I've ever heard was on the Meze Empyrean. The... Empyrean's musicality just shines through on this record. The instruments are so cohesive, and the sound stage collapses and expands right along with the bands and its many turns. The band is having a great time. You can hear it on the record, and, and I listened to this album at 3 a.m., and I couldn't turn it off. This was my favorite Empyrean experience. Say that ten times fast. It took me ten takes to do that. Now, <laughs> the Empyrean took advantage of the album's sound stage and dynamics there was a, a perfect synergy between hardware and software that came together for one of the best presentations of this record i've ever heard if i end up keeping the meze it will be because of what it did to london calling now next we're going to head off the beaten path with another of my favorite bands i'm talking about midnight oil the aussie alt rock band led by frontman peter garrett this was a huge band in the 1980s think of them as kind of the rem of australia Australia. They were into causes from environmental to social justice before it was even a thing. They scored a couple of big records in Diesel and Dust and Blue Sky Mining. Both are excellent top tier records, but I'm going to call your attention to the follow up Earth and Sun and Moon. This featured some of Peter's most on point lyrics combined with these tasty melodic hooks. It's wonderfully musical. I love taking this one in. Feeding Frenzy has great instrumentation. Truganini was the single off this record. It has a hypnotic bass line. You gotta check it out. It's a beautiful record that can turn on the attitude when it needed to. The sound gets very big on the meze. It's thick and layered with jangly guitars, and but it never overdrives itself. Everything stays perfectly sorted. Now, my last musical artist is, is Art Blakey, and I can't seem to get enough of his album Monin lately. It's a Blue Note recording, DSD-64. Most of this record centers around a conversation between Benny Golson on sax and the great Lee Morgan on trumpet. The title track, Monin, is one of the great numbers in jazz history. There is wonderful channel separation with Benny Golson's sax sitting out at 3 p.m. and then you have Lee's trumpet sitting at 10 a.m. And then there's a slight room reverb that's pervasive throughout all the tracks. It gives it this sense of intimacy and space at the same time. Both horns are crisp into the note, that, but the headphone is more on point with the sax. It sounds very lifelike. 
And then there's also a piano off to the left, which is pushing out the rhythm. It's played by Bobby Timmons, who wrote, actually wrote the song. You have a sense of exactly how hard he's hitting the keys as he's playing. It's gorgeous. But the trumpet is something of a problem for me on this, at least on the solo. At the point of the breath, when he takes his breath and he punches the note out, there's this percussive effect on the left driver that sounds really unnatural. It really kind of spoiled the song for me. Earlier I mentioned about what a great drum headphone the Empyrean is, and on Monin, Blakey's mastery and his touch is just incredible. And I, I also did a deep dive into Led Zeppelin IV, one of the greatest drum sounds ever recorded on an album. And from the solo in rock and roll to Misty Mountain Hop to When the Levee Breaks, the Empyrean gives you a great chance to feel the impact and damage that John Bonham could impart on a set of skins. I'm going to say one last thing about music before I wrap this episode up. I'm a, I'm a big fan of these headphones. They're, they're super comfortable, and they have a show quality that I appreciate in any headphone. When you put on an album, the music is presented to you. It's going to show you a version of the songs you love in a way that you haven't heard them before. Its goal isn't precision, it's presentation. This is a quality that I appreciate in any headphone, as opposed to trying to be letter accurate to the original recorded material. This, these take you on a ride. I can say the same thing sort of about the Focal Utopia, I think, but I most enjoy these headphones on music that have a big presentation. Think of like George Harrison's All Things Must Pass, Motown, Phil Spector's Wall of Sound, Adele. Any album that sounds big seems to excel with the Meze Imperium. Admittedly, $3,000 is a lot of money. That's a shit ton of money. So they better not ride the fence. This is a lot of money for a headphone. That said, if you're looking for the most comfortable headphone ever, the most comfortable, bar none, with a slightly darker tonality while retaining the treble sparkle and gloss on the top layer, while delivering a solid bass and major, major soundstage and world-class dynamics, this may be the headphone for you. So I'd like to kindly ask you to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. We've dropped a lot of cash in the last month, goodness. <laughs> but the ride gets even more interesting. Coming up, I have another stupid major purchase in-house. Actually, two major purchases waiting to be unboxed. I can't wait to share them to you. I may actually reorder things a little bit and unbox one of them next. I've got more offerings from both Linsoul and Audio 46, not to mention the sound check of the stunning, the stunning Focal Radiance that was also sent to us by Audio 46. Now, if you liked today's episode, give me a thumbs up or, you know, do the other thing if you think I totally chunked it. I can't say I blame you either way, but I know this, I will see you before you know it.